Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, coming to uh, this month's uh, ABL market briefing. Um, good turnout. That's that's great. There's a bit of train trouble this morning for me this morning, so I'm, I'm lucky to uh, have got here on time. But uh, anyway, that's uh, that's a normal uh, in this day and age. So um, the the topic of this uh, briefing uh, this uh, month, uh, the technical topic, is uh, turbochargers. So uh, what they do, why they break down and uh, why repairs are, are so expensive. And to talk about that, I've got uh, some uh, friends of mine from a company in Southampton, a global company based in Southampton, um, who repair and service uh, turbochargers. Uh, they're the experts, so they're gonna uh, tell you all about uh, uh, turbochargers. So moving on to the next slide, which isn't working. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Good. Okay. Right. So um our briefing this morning, as as you probably know, is accredited uh, uh, by the Chartered uh, Insurance Institute, and delegates can claim up to one hour CPD for your participation here. Uh, we will therefore keep a record of those of you in the room and uh, those of you logging online. And if you haven't already done so, please make sure you sign in with the team on the desk outside after the briefing in order to uh, be able to receive your follow-up email and your CPD accreditation or certification, rather. Um, today's um, presentation presenters will be myself. Uh, I'm the uh, Technical Director of Maritime ABL Group, um, Jean-Paul um, as a party, the technical director of TSI Group. And we've got Ed McNally, uh, the sales director of TSI. Rob Chester is the international sales manager uh, from TSI. And uh, the uh, case studies will be done this uh, month by Jasper um, from ABL. So please note the usual caveats apply and the Chatham House rules apply. So please remember that the information contained in today's presentations and any opinions or comments expressed are those of the presenters and not necessarily those of ABL. And at the time of, uh, at the end of today's briefing, we, we ask you if you take uh, three minutes out of your time to complete the online survey. Uh, this is really critical to us for our CPD accreditation status and allows us to continue to offer you one CPD point per briefing. It also means we can actively look at how we can approve these, match, these briefings to match uh, your requirements and needs. Before I begin today, we ask you to give a few moments thought to seafaring men and women at sea today. Uh, even though COVID-19 does seem to be increasingly in the rear view mirror, we know that seafarers are still working often longer um, shifts than they're meant to due to crew change issues. There's also a course of, uh, of course, multitude of other factors going on in the world that impact um, adversely their lives and conditions at sea. So, turbochargers. Key presentation objectives. Now, what you're going to learn today is what uh, a turbocharger does, um, why they're so important for uh, engine performance, uh, why they break down, uh, the cost and benefits of using non-OEM repairers. That's the uh, key thing we're going to bring to you today. And um, you'll see some case studies of a, of a breakdown and repair. I think there's a couple of those. So over to John Paul for the next uh, slides. Okay, so good morning, everyone. So we're gonna take a quick look what the turbocharger is, how it performs, what are the common factors, common issues we encounter every day, um, uh, with customers globally, and what may cause a turbocharger to uh, break down. Okay, so so a turbocharger means charging the engine with pressurized air using um, uh, exhaust gases generated by the cylinders. More air being charged by the turbocharger into the engine, the more air will be injected into the cylinders and therefore more power will be generated by the engine, therefore creating more torque by the diesel generator engine. The turbocharger system is 10% of the engine cost, but 
um, uh, of the engine power. Therefore, a, a diesel engine without a turbocharger will not go very far. So how does a turbocharger work? A part of the exhaust gas energy is treated by the turbine. The turbine power is then transmitted to a compressor, which is connected to the rotating shaft. The, um, uh, the air is then pressurized through the RPM generate, generated by the uh, turbine rotor shaft. Air pressure is pressurized into the charger cooler and into the scavenger space and into the cylinders. This is therefore causing the engine uh, to work at a high power density without the increase of thermal load, therefore keeping the temperatures within the cylinders at uh, a lower value. What are turbochargers and so important for engines performance, especially on marine vessels? So uh, I've got the little corner, but anyways, I can do it from here. Yeah, well, I can do it from the monitor. So. So as we said, the main purpose is to increase the specific power output of the engine, lower specific fuel consumption, because we have a balanced fuel to air ratio within the cylinders. Key performance uh, figures that we um, uh, analyze every day in order to ensure and assess how the turbocharger is performing are um, the achievable compressor uh, pressure ratio the turbo turbocharger efficiency, meaning the delta between the inlet and the outlet, uh, which is transformed into kinetic energy, and the specific airflow. What is the airflow being generated by the turbocharger? All, all these figures need to sum up in order to have a proper operating system between engine and turbocharger. The customer value is 300% more power, 10% lower specific fuel consumption, and above all, reduced emissions. We all know that if a turbocharger system is not working properly, black smoke comes out of the funnel. And um, this, is, this is caused because the fuel to air ratio is, is incorrect. Okay, why do turbochargers break down? I'm gonna show you a quick video. This one, this video will uh, is an animation about lube oil contamination. How does lube oil contamination um, uh, affect the bearings, the radial bearings within a turbocharger. Welcome to the new development from Carco. Main engine turbocharger failure, always an expensive proposition. A real-time incident digitally recreated to bring to fore the consequences of a main engine turbocharger failure. Okay, so we're gonna go back a little bit. Apologies. Okay, so we, what we see here is um, uh, an internal lubricated turbocharger, which uses lubrication coming from the main engine. Lube oil is pumped through the oil pump and through the lube oil channels into the, um, uh, into the radial bearings. Exhaust gases are penetrating the lube oil chamber through the labyrinths. Obviously this shouldn't happen, but a poor um, uh, balanced or a poor operating turbocharger um, will lead for exhaust gases to penetrate the lube oil chamber, therefore mixing with lube oil. Causing uh, radial bearing journal damages on the turbine shafts.
and eventually total failure of the radial bearings. Now, when total failure of the radial bearing happens, in plane bearings, you get excessive radial clearance, a drop of Luboy pressure, and eventually catastrophic failure because of metal-to-metal -metal, uh, friction between the radial bearings and the turbine shaft. The second most common factor of turbocharger breakdown is the foreign object damage. Foreign object damage is coming from the scavenger manifold, sca uh, exhaust manifold, which is then let into the turbine, turbocharger through the nozzle ring and then eventually hitting the turbine blades. What you're seeing there is a turbine wheel with broken blades that were hit by a foreign object, such as exhaust valve, exhaust valve seat, exhaust bellows in the internal, uh, protection of the exhaust bellow, which sometimes if used uh, for a long time, they collapse and then pieces of these bellows come in at, a, uh, at a, uh, hitting the turbine wheel, rotating at 30,000 RPM. This is the result of the damage. For an object damage can, can be caused when a piece of exhaust valve, exhaust valve seat or exhaust bellow breaks off, making its way into turbocharger gas and leg casing through the exhaust manifold, hitting the turbine wheel at a certain velocity. This would cause immediate damage to the turbine blades, causing total unbalance, obviously, because a piece of the blade is missing uh, on a rotor that is balanced at, uh, depending obviously the size, but at 20 gram millimeter, this will cause total failure of, of the rotor. Balancing of the rotor, as we said before, is, is most important. Uh, we often get questions such as, uh, can we just do the cleaning on board and uh, change the bearings because we don't have the time to, to land the rotor? Uh, we understand that the market has changed and the vessels have, have to sail and they don't have the time to stay in port. However, balancing is very important. This is because when we clean on board, the cleaning is not going to be uh, done accurately. We're not going to bring the rotor into what it used to be as far as balancing tolerances are concerned. So um, uh, it is very important to balance the rotors periodically according to the maker's uh, exchange intervals. Balancing of rotors is one of the most critical activities required to maintain a proper operational turbocharger. Turbocharger rotors are exposed to impulses coupled with centrifugal forces, which we will see later on uh, how much are those centrifugal forces, which require a low unbalance tolerance in order to ensure the no damage is caused to the turbocharger radial bearings. Obviously, unbalance um, uh, the, the critical factor on the bearings because of the vibration that they can cause. Balancing of a rotor, an example of rotor unbalance shown here under for a radial turbine wheel with a diameter of 130 millimeters, so it's, it's not really big. An unbalance of 20 grams rotating at 15,000 RPM can cause a total unbalance of 3,000 newtons, which is equivalent to 306 kilograms. So it's, it's quite a lot. This is another um, uh, common factor that we get questioned a lot. Uh, it happens due to sudden changes in load, um, fouling of nozzle rings, changes in, uh, in fuel system, and we get cold and we say, we're hearing noises from the turbocharger. This, these noises are normally surging, which we will see now a quick video. Okay, so that blowout, that is back pressure coming in, coming back from the scavenge space blowing back into the uh, out of the air filter causing obviously a slowdown of the rotor it is an air explosion obviously is if, if exposed at a longer uh, periodic distance uh, time frame the result will be in collapse of the compressor wheel.
yeah the video is not on uh, the sound is not on but but it's a really loud bang it sounds like an explosion in the engine room So how, how is surging uh, cost? Now, we often intervene on turbochargers where we see a collapse of the compressor wheel. And this is the first investigation we do. We try to understand whether there was surging on this turbocharger, which caused the collapse of the compressor side. So surging at high loads obviously should be avoided. Uh, if noticed, it needs to be um, counteracted. Excessive load of the rotating parts during surging can cause damage. The turbocharger speed may increase momentarily by 15% during surging. There are three main causes of surging. Flow restriction and fouling in the air exhaust gas system. Uh, fouling of the nozzling, such as uh, bunkering bad fuel, dirty fuel, and therefore exposing the nozzling to a buildup of sulfuric acid. Reducing the cap of the nozzling increases the speed of the turbocharger which then the charger cooler is not accepting. So sending back into the turbocharger. Malfunctioning of the fuel, uh, the engine fuel system, uh, loss of calibration between the governor and the fuel uh, pumps, leading to excessive fuel or dripping of fuel injectors into your exhaust manifold, eventual detonation of the uh, fuel in the exhaust manifold, sending a sudden ex uh, load of exhaust pressure towards the turbocharger, will lead into surging. And rapid variation in engine load, such as, for example, um, you are underway, adding on the shaft generator, increasing a sudden load, not allowing the engine to react and accepting that additional scavenger pressure will result into surging. Normally, you have to reduce the load and adjust accordingly. What is surging exactly? So basically, surging is Normal operation is the uh, compressor wheel, suctioning in the air through the filter silencer, producing compressed air through the air diffuser into the um, charger cooler. We then, the, if the charger cooler is not accepting this air, we have what we call a boundary layer breakdown. The airspeed is not converted into pressure anymore because we have back pressure, air heats up, and then we have a reversal, which is the explosion of the air resulting in what the video we've seen before and the back pressure from the filter silencer. Another cause is overspeed. Overspeed can happen in many ways. It is another element which may lead to catastrophic failure of the turbocharger. As we've seen here, as we can see here from the pictures, blades actually flew out of the turbine wheel. The engine may not necessarily go into overspeed. This is because an engine that is operating at 900 RPM will remain at 900 RPM, but the turbocharger is operating at 30,000 RPM. There are two different systems which communicate with each other, but they don't run at the same speed. One is affected by the other, and one helps the other to perform. Overspeed, um, but a malfunctioning of the fuel system, as we said before, such as dripping of the fuel injectors or um, uh, malfunctioning of the fuel pumps, a fuel pump which gets stuck, or a sudden increase in load may lead to an increase in exhaust pressure, sending the turbocharger into overspeed. This happens if surging is not slowing down the rotor, if the charger cooler is accepting that air, then overspeed is the next um, uh, scenario that you will be faced with and which will lead to catastrophic failure. Such overspeed can cause the turbine blade to come of the fear tree leading to total imbalance of the turbine wheel, okay? This overspeed is very easily um, investigated because the signs of overspeed will show you such as the dumping wire uh, bent toward the outside. So you can see that there has been an increased centrifugal force which has led for the parts to uh, expand towards the outer diameter of the turbine wheel. Another concept which is sometimes ignored 
but then eventually causes a breakdown. So no surging, no um, uh, no overspeed, and no foreign bodies. This is the exchange interval of the main component, which is the rotor, the rotating element. So uh, makers, turbocharger makers, have developed a safety design concept, which is called SECO, as a calculation tool used by turbocharger companies to determine the speed and temperature limits for the compressor and turbine of a turbocharger for a given exchange interval. We know that the bearings have a lifetime. We know that the oil pumps have a lifetime, but what is the lifetime of the main component? So this is normally stamped on the rating plate of the turbocharger. The information is given on the time at the, on the rating plate. Engine, engine requirements, engine builders request a certain pressure ratio for a new engine design based on what the market wants. The turbocharger manufacturer develops develops turbocharger that meets the engine builder's requirements. Okay, so the, the turbochargers are designed according to the needs and then the SECO concept is applied according to those needs. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that every engine has the same exchange interval. Very high loads act on the turbocharger rotor during operation, which exposes them to a damage process. In order to achieve high highest operation reliability for these parts, turbocharger makers recommend operational limits and exchange intervals. It is obviously, the, the it, it depends the application. So if it's a direct propulsion, if it is electro propulsion, if it is a generator, all of these things will compromise um, uh, the, the exchange interval for the main component, which we always recommend to respect. The reason why this is recommended is, is described here in this slide. Rotors are exposed to high kinetic energy. The kinetic, kinetic energy of a bladed shaft equivalent to a large truck by uh, passing at, at 95 kilometers. So what we have here is a shaft, a bladed shaft weighing 390 kilograms. Okay, it's substantially big rotor. Tip velocity at 9,900 RPM equivalent to 1,750 kilometers an hour, we have a centrifugal force of 97 tons per blade and a total 3,200 tons of blades. So what begins as a very, very minimal imbalance, once placed in operation and rotating at 9,000, now 9,900 RPM is not much. This, that's meaning moving at economy speed, but once we push at 90%, these turbochargers will have turbochargers running at 15 to 20,000 RPM and, and over. So the centrifugal force increases much more. Examples of causes that uh, uh, breakdowns caused by uh, lack of uh, respecting of the exchange intervals caused by internal fatigue of the material, which is total explosion of the uh, compressor wheel as we see here, so that in, in compressor wheel has completely collapsed and blew up, causing for total damage of the air casing and rupture of the turbocharger compressor site. The concepts of SECO, the damage mechanism, SECO takes account of the main damage mechanisms involved, which are creep and fatigue, internal creeps in the material and fatigue of the material, uh, metal, just like us, needs to rest. We need to rest every evening. Metal needs to rest every certain amount of hours. The operating, the operating conditions taken into consideration are the turbocharger speed profile. So how much is this turbocharger running at? The uh, suction air temperature and obviously the exhaust gas temperature. So for example, on a gas engine, turbochargers are exposed at a much higher uh, exhaust temperature. So the exchange interval will arrive earlier, while on a diesel engine that maybe is operating at 400 degrees, the exchange interval will arrive a little bit later. These are obviously uh, calculations that the maker make and stamps them on the rating plate. So what is a creep? A creep is a continuous and time-dependent damage process. It causes permanent deformation and can in time lead to failure, the process is controlled by the temperature and stress levels. So we have constant forces applied. One obviously is where the blade is inside the um, turbine wheel and the turbine disc and constant force applied opposing, 
opposing to that side. Ex the material is trying to extend itself and exposed at different thermal loads. So, which is cooling, heating, cooling, heating, because obviously the engine is not running at uh, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. So all these changes in the uh, thermal loading of the, of the blade causes for a creep within the material, which eventually causes the blade to detach itself from, uh, from the foot. Fatigue, fatigue is when the material is basically tired of the, um, of the continuous exposure to the thermal factors and it creates cracks internally. It's a damage process in, induced by cycle loading. It causes local cracks and can in time lead to failure. The process is mainly controlled by the stress amplitude and the number of cycles. So we know, for example, um, uh, a lot of owners uses rotors on exchange in order to move material. So we one, one rotor comes out, another rotor comes in. This helps prolong the life of, of the main component. Why? Because funnily enough, that rotor is resting. So I pass, I pass to my colleague, Ed McNally. Okay, the benefits of using uh, quality non-OEM alternatives and why? Well, the first of all is a big one there, reduction in claims value. Uh, independence can offer reduced labor and spares costs and can also reduce repair time and minimize the off hire costs of a vessel. By reducing the time to do the repair, you're getting that vessel back to sea quicker. Flexibility on delivery, lead time of spare parts is crucial. Uh, you have to have spare parts available in order to complete the repair. And the, you have to do this in the shortest possible time. Traceability of spare parts. You need to know that the spare parts that are being used are 100% quality controlled, guaranteed, and to specification. Working practices. Working practices need to be to a regulated ISO and also approved by class. And there are companies with class approval for working practices. Technical support. This is a, a big thing when it comes to, oh, sorry, come back. Technical support, the ability to, to offer options, whether it be repair or replacement, it can be sometimes quicker to repair than wait for a part to come in. Uh, so having the ability to, to offer those options is crucial. And also within a failure, you need to know um, what has caused the failure. So for, for you guys, the, 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 let's say, having somebody who can be there and explain what the, the possibilities are or the, um, let's say, the probable causes are for the failure is important. Warranty on spare parts. Well, warranties are given by various makers and um, independent turbocharger companies. You can get warranties from three months, six months, 12 months. So a warranty after the job is crucial. And also understanding that the parts that have been fitted will be suitable for, for, the, for that turbocharger, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, to the next overhaul interval, which could be five years down the line. Um, dedicated breakdown teams. Now, when you've got a failure, you need to get things um, running quickly. Yeah. You can't leave it to somebody else. You have to have a team that's going to take hold of that failure and do all the logistics, do all the, the uh, transport of engineers, getting engineers, getting parts out to the vessel. 
liaising with the um, local um, ship's agents, liaising with the customer itself. So having a dedicated breakdown team allows things to run much smoother. I'll just go on to a, a case study um, on this one. We had a product tanker. I think it was a 40,000 deadweight ton. It was on its way from Rotterdam to Turkey. Coming out of Rotterdam, it actually had a failure. And the ship manager tried to contact the um, maker out of hours. Now, this was a Friday night, so early hours of the morning. Ship manager's in a panic. He needs to contact someone quickly. He needs to get the vessel, someone to the vessel to try and fathom out what the failure was and, and get it fixed. Now, this vessel had one turbocharger. So it went down from 14 knots down to five. And it had, was making its way down to Brest where they could do, go into Anchorage. And we were contacted early hours on Saturday morning. And within 45 minutes, we were able to confirm engineers availability to attend that vessel when she came into Brest, which was supposed to be on the, the uh, 31st which was um, a day later. So by doing that, gave the, gave the uh, ship manager confidence that we could supply the, the turbocharger engineers. We also gave them, based on some uh, just photographs, uh, we, we gave him a list of parts that we considered he would need to, to repair that turbocharger in port. Um, based on that, we got the order to do it. And it was basically 45 minutes later. That's how critical it was to them. We got engineers on board um, on the, the 31st. Um, they were, when on board, they were able to strip the turbocharger down within three hours. And they were able to advise then ad any additional parts that were required. Now, we mobilized part, uh, people from the UK but we also had parts of availability in Rotterdam. So we would be, were able to do two things at once. One, get the guys on board, and also then to um, basically have the parts being prepared and made ready to get to the vessel. We managed to um, get all the parts on board um, on the first at 1,600 hours, and the ship was ready to sail as you can see there, by 2,100 hours. And it was tested. She was on her way later that night. So what, what caused it? Well, it was a failure of a turbine side bearing after 11,000 hours. Now, bearings are supposed to last 12,000 hours, but they can have a shorter life based on certain conditions with inside the turbocharger affecting them. Um, the TS, TSI's invoice price for this was 89,000 euro, and that included everything, parts, labor, getting engineers down. The maker's price for the rotor alone was 150,000 euro. That's just for one part, not all the other parts that, were, that had been damaged and whatever in the failure. And that was without any um, service costs, transport costs, everything. And, Everything happened over the weekend, as they, as they normally do. So the lead time for the makers was three to four days, X-Works. We had the parts in stock. We were able to deliver in two. So when you look at this, the, what we've done is we've been able to not only save the the price of the parts, save on the price of the parts, but actually, in this case, uh, the, the off-hire saving was four days. We estimated it at four days. If, the, if they'd managed to contact the maker and the maker had been on board, then it would have been four days longer off-hire. Um, we have another case, which was basically a container vessel. Okay.
but this is a bigger saving. <laughs> I'll, I'll just flick, I'll flick through it. Okay, yeah, okay. Um, so this was a container vessel. This one, um, we were called, we had the, the, the vessel manager uh, asked if we could attend in, in Antwerp on the 19th. This was on the 12th, said he, had, he, may, he may have had a turbocharger issue. She was on her way for, to Tangier and then up to Antwerp. We um, then got a call on the 14th when the vessel manager actually got his fleet manager on board and was able to open up the turbocharger to see exactly what was uh, wrong. And they found that there was severe damages inside. So that the case changed then. It wasn't just an overhaul. It was a breakdown. So we managed to, to, to get him a price and a delivery on the parts for four days. And um, the next day, after reviewing all the uh, offers that he'd had from the makers and others, uh, we were given a job based on the availability of the parts. Again, they wanted the ship back on, on, on the seas as quickly as possible. Um, so we, we managed to get all the parts available and engineers on standby within the within them formed four days. The vessel was delayed slightly because she was a two engine. She had two turbochargers. She could still um, sail, but she was sailing at a slower speed. So she was delayed. But we attended the vessel at anchor on the twenty first. <clears throat> excuse me, um, and we were able to do two turbochargers exchange. Two turbo. Sorry, do a total exchange on one and an overhaul, an overhaul on another because the, the owner was a bit uh, dubious about the condition of the other. So we, within a 36 hour anchorage, we were able to do the two turbochargers. Now the, the OEM wanted, the maker wanted five to six days to do that job. We did it within 48 hours, 36 to be precise. So when you look at this one, uh, we completed the job in two days, and also we had a total price of three hundred twenty-nine thousand euro. The maker's price for parts alone was seven hundred and twenty. And in this case, we also estimate that there is a five to six day saving on off hire costs because of that. So significant save, savings all around. So that's you. Well, to uh, Jasper, the case studies. Um, you should have learned today what uh, turbochargers do, why they're so important to engine performance, uh, why they break down. I certainly learned something there today as well. Uh, the costs and benefits of uh, using non-OEM uh, repairers, which uh, is perfectly demonstrated, um, there's a significant uh, difference in the figures there, which um, we as surveyors are aware of, and have been for a number of years, this, um, you know, this, this big difference in, uh, in makers' uh, costs to, to third parties. And, um, and you've seen a couple of case studies now. So there's questions. Um, questions, can we leave them to the end now? Um, and um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll wind up at the end and, and let you know um, at the appropriate time. So moving on to the case reports and Jasper. Give a quick hand to TSI for coming in. Thanks, guys. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, we might not have time to go through all the case reports today, so I'll wait till uh, Paul pulls the plug on me. Um, the purpose of this section of the briefing is simply to show you uh, some of the recent higher cost cases that ABL have been involved in. This will hopefully show you or remind you of the sorts of incidents and casualties that can happen in shipping and marine operations. But in case some of you haven't attended these briefings before, uh, you might be asking, what are these so-called case reports? Well, these feature largely, but not exclusively, uh, whole machinery casualties um, with estimated cost of repair in excess of a quarter of a million dollars, usually excluding salvage costs. They usually cover uh, only a subset, uh, these actually do cover only a subset of the total ABL group caseload, which of course includes many other areas apart from just H&M, typically between 10 and 20% by ABL case numbers. These case reports, nevertheless, are a significant subset of our H&M work. 
For although they uh, cover only about 20 to 25 percent of the H&M cases we survey by number, they cover around, in fact, 65 to 75 percent of the H&M cases we survey by cost. Treat with caution, though. Estimated costs are often preliminary and subject to further inspections and slash or investigations. In presenting these case reports for the last month of activity, it's not about attributing blame. We just aim to convey what happened, so we won't be given any definitive conclusions about cause. As many of the cases are still fresh, it wouldn't be appropriate to do so. And in many cases, the cause is still under investigation anyway. As usual, oops, sorry. Let's move on to uh, last month's statistics. So this is an overview of October for 2023, proportions by number. I've been notified of 21 high cost cases during October, and I've been added in, and I've added in two more that were third party damages associated with that passenger ship from a couple of months ago that broke her moorings and got blown onto a moor tanker on the other side of the harbor. Do you remember? She damaged both tank the tanker and the jetty that she was moored to. That's uh, 23 cases in total. The blue columns in this graph show the proportional distribution of those 23 casualties by casualty type. Six machinery cases, three groundings, three engine room fires, three collisions uh, or contacts, one rudder problem, two heavy weather cases, one sinking, one structural problem, three tail shaft issues, and no crane incidents for a change. As always, with such a small sample set, you are bound to have a few gaps in the distribution uh, that you see here when you compare it to the distribution for a whole year. In this case, the whole of 22, 2022, given as the gray columns. But despite this, you can see that October roughly follows the same historical, oops, sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, the total estimated uh, repair cost for the 23 cases is $55 million, and that puts the average cost for October at $2.4 million, uh, about twice the typical annual average background figure of $1 million that we have seen over many years in face value terms for these higher cost cases when individual extreme losses uh, of over $50 million are excluded. Now, we've had many low cost, uh, low cost months this year with averages below that $1 million mark, Let's see how, uh, how the big losses include this month, uh, have in, ha, included this month have affected the year's cumulative totals. In terms of casualty proportions by number, well, not much. You can see that the cumulative trend is, little, is a little different from last month. Indeed, it's shaping up to a similar pattern to last year and indeed previous years. Nothing particularly unusual appears to be happening, yet at least, regarding the relative incidence of the different casualty types. But here we have added in the proportions of the cumulative costs and three things have changed since last month. First, we have two new spikes in the fire and heavy weather categories. Second, the high cost incidents this month have reduced the relative significance of the costs uh, of all the other casualty types. Of particular interest to here are the machinery cases, Whereas up until last month, the red column for ER machinery was near the same as the blue column. Now you can see that it has dropped to two thirds the height of the blue column. This is much more in line with what we used to see before the pandemic. And third, the average casualty cost for the year has now risen to $955,000 from $660,000 last month, back to the historical level for these higher cost cases. We kept telling you each month that things could change quickly. Anyway, let's move on now to look at some of October cases uh, in more detail. We've selected eight of them, uh, as I said, if we have time to go through them all today. And bear in mind that although we say these are the October cases, this, uh, the month generally refers to when the advice first comes in from our surveyor. Some of the cases therefore may actually be from earlier months. First up, we have an engine room fire that was successfully contained within the engine room, but with costs nevertheless approaching a couple of million dollars. The vessel is a 21-year-old livestock carrier, and here she is at anchor after the incident. The story is uh, that by midday, one day, she had loaded 3,660 cattle and was departing port. At 12.20, the chief engineer contacted the bridge, requesting the main engine to be stopped as it was leaking fuel. The master said it was not possible as the vessel was in the channel and under pilotage. 
The engine room crew were not able to stop the leak, and at 12.25, the leaking fuel, uh, which was more uh, of a spray, hit hot engine parts and caught fire. The fire alarm sounded, and the main engine had to be shut down by the chief engineer. All engine room personnel immediately evacuated the space, and after mustering the crew and closing off the air and fuel, the master instructed the chief engineer to discharge the CO2 fixed fire system into the engine room to distinguish the fire. The two, uh, two harbour tugs were in the vicinity and assisted to tow the vessel to a designated anchorage within the port area. The vessel was safely anchored and at 13.30, uh, all livestock services were fully reinstated using emergency systems. There was no report of any injury to crew or the cattle. Let's have a look now at the damage. The CO2 system and all the associated procedures seem to have worked reasonably well. So we don't have a complete, uh, completely burnt out engine room. We'll see one of those later, hopefully. You can see the damage to the deck head above the engine. And if you can look closely, you can see a couple of units of the engine which are charred and therefore point to the likely origins of the fuel leak. Here we are closing in on that um, area of the engine. And close-up inspections led the investigators to the number two cylinder high pressure fuel injector being the likely source of the leak. The exact nature and cause of the leak is still under investigation. Our surveyor has marked out the areas affected by the fire. And you can see that this has been limited in extent to the spaces directly above the engine and its near surroundings. While the emergency procedures and CO2 system deployment worked pretty successfully, of course, it would have been better if they had shut the engine down immediately um, when they spotted the fuel leak. But this is easy to say from our armchairs when we don't have collisions and groundings to worry about. Anyway, let's uh, take a look around a bit more at the affected area. Here we see some shots of the state of the control room, which has been affected by the heat and smoke from the fire. Melted equipment and soot damage can be seen. And of course, a large component of the repairs in any fire casualty is reinstating the wiring runs that tend to be largely located at the deck heads. Here we see a scorched cable tray above the main engine. And here, more examples of, of affected wiring above the generators and the main engine. The particular port uh, on the other side of the world from here where this all occurred is not well suited to ship repairs. After assessment of all the damage and the available facilities and logistics of getting new equipment and contractors to the vessel, it was going to be more cost effective to tow the ship to a major far eastern repair port for repairs. So here we see harbour tugs, uh, tugs at work, first bringing the ship in from the anchorage to disembark its four-legged passengers, and then taking the ship out to an ocean-going tug for the tow. It's a manned tow, which is always more comforting for approving surveyors as crew will be watching out for water ingress and so on during the trip. About $200,000 of temporary repairs were required, though, to get necessary electrical systems for... Ooh, I can't quite see this bit. Uh, about $200,000 of temporary repairs were required, though, to get necessary electrical systems working for the riding crew plus to strengthen some of the four-deck more equipment to take the higher potential tow line forces. And here, finally, we see the tug repairing to connect up uh, her towing line to the ship. Okay, next up, we have an unfortunate collision between two vessels from the same company. Hopefully, at least, discussions between the owner and himself as to whose fault it was will have been more amicable than normal. It was about nine o'clock at night when our 15-year-old safety standby vessel on the left was returning to the port in the Middle East and encountered uh, the much larger tug or supply vessel that was leaving port. The vessels were on near reciprocal courses, each steaming at nine knots. With 10 minutes between them, the tug contacted the standby vessel and they agreed a green to green, i.e. starboard to starboard side, passing rather than the more conventional red to red. It should have worked, and it nearly did, but I understand there may, he, may have been some distraction on one of the vessels. A phone call taken by an officer on watch has been mentioned. Whatever happened, the two vessels ended up hitting each other uh, green to green on their starboard bows in the configuration as shown here. Although it would have been dark at the time, of course, 
Not surprising, our little standby vessel came off worse with the overhanging bows of the tug also contacting the smaller vessel's accommodation. Life rafts and fast rescue boat uh, on her starboard side. Oop, that is my, my bad. Sorry, everybody. Here we see her in dry dock. Nothing terribly obvious from this angle, but if you look closely, you can see incidents and disturbances to the side shell and bullock area of the starboard bow, and some disturbances uh, to the tire fender down the side. Here's a closer view of those tires, and the half round diagonal fendering has been impacted as well. Now we're up on the um, forecastle uh, deck and the crushed. Uh, and distorted deck plating has been cropped out already, exposing the marked up damage to the side shell and stiffeners below. The damage to the starboard side of the accommodation block in way of the master's cabin has also been cropped out. And moving down along the starboard side, we find in the left photo, a couple of life rafts have been knocked out of their cradles and their casings heavily scuffed. And in the right photo, that the fast rescue craft has been ripped uh, off its davit and has landed tail down on the main deck, with obvious damages to its stern drive system, plus holes and impacts to the hull. With all the other damages on the starboard side, we're looking at around a half a million dollars of repairs. Meanwhile, as I indicated, the tug that uh, hit her has comparatively minor damages some misalignment to the anchor, some plating incidents, and some disturbed fendering only. The degree of overhang and the bow flare that probably caused most of the damage to the smaller vessel is not obvious in this shot. But you can see it here where they have cropped out some of the dented plating. Only around $150,000 worth of repairs to this vessel, which is why she doesn't appear on our case reports listings in her own right. Okay, uh, just a single slide overview for this next case of an 18 year old VLCC whose owners had a nasty surprise when they discovered half a million dollars worth of damages to the propeller and stern tube system when they docked in the Middle East for a class intermediate survey. Two propeller blades were damaged at their leading edges and will need to be built up by welding and polishing. The rope guard, aft seal, liner and aft stern tube bearing will all have to be replaced and the tail shaft will need to be machined or possibly caused by fishing nets or wires. Owners are checking their records to see where and when this is likely to have happened. And our surveyor is checking the ship's records to see if there uh, were any warning signs to such an incident having occurred that could have stopped the damage from getting as bad as it did. Okay, I think I'll have to, uh, we've got time for one more. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's have a look now at the, at the big one for this month. There we are. An engine room fire on a five-year-old cutter suction dredger that, unlike the first case we looked at, wasn't successfully contained within the engine room and led to damages and order of magnitude much higher. The dredger was eight days into a dredging job in the Middle East when, at five to three one afternoon, a fire alarm sounded and soon afterwards flames and smoke were seen coming from the port side funnel. Severe vibrations were then felt throughout the vessel, followed by a blackout. In the engine room, the oiler had heard an abnormal sound from the engine of the port main generator, followed by smoke from its turbocharger. By the time the chief engineer arrived, heavy smoke had started to fill the engine room and large flames were also visible. The crew shut down the, the machinery and all the quick closing valves. They attempted to fight the fire from the adjacent pump room using fire hoses until the master ordered the engine room to be sealed. The CO2 was released at 10 past three. That's 15 minutes after the fire alarm went off and arguably a bit slow. I've always been told that you really need to get the CO2 released within 10 minutes for the best chance of extinguishing a fire. Anyway, at the same time, a standby uh, multi-cat vessel started to assist with firefighting. And a few minutes later, a tug arrived and commenced boundary cooling by water spray onto the dredger's port side. Despite these efforts, by 3.30, the fire was declared out of control and the crew disembarked onto the standby vessel. Three large firefighting tugs arrived later. We see one of them here, and eventually, by about 0200 hours, a day and a half later, the fire was finally declared uh, to be extinguished. 22.5 million here, 
uh, with 1.85 million for the first case, excluding the towage, uh, which will probably be $700,000 on top. Here we see the vessel a few days later. It's hard to tell the front deck uh, from the back, of, so the, sorry, the front from the back, but this is the port side with the cutter head at the bow on the left and the walking spuds at the stern on the right. During the incident, floods, uh, flooding also occurred in the engine room via the seawater inlet pipes. Apparently, the gaskets of the joints had failed with the intense heat. I understand this was being pumped out when this picture was taken. But when you get closer uh, and you see the burned paintwork in way of the funnels and engine room sides. On board now, you can see the deformation of the engine room access door and the shattered glass of the portholes to the engine room upper spaces and absence of paint. Plus the distortion of the engine room external bulkheads, fire dampers plus heat damage to the uh, external equipment. All this doesn't bode well for what's inside. And indeed, it's all a terrible mess. Decks, stairways, overhead crane rails distorted and sagging from the fire and heat. The engines, pumps, basically all of the machinery and equipment in the engine room needs to be a place, uh, needs to be replaced. Here's a close up of that sagging overhead crane rail. It should be straight and horizontal. On the left here, we see the fire affected engine control room. And on the right, we see that some effects of the fire have extended to the adjacent pump room. Let's get out of here. Back on deck, we see deck plating and walkways distorted by the heat and looking into the accommodation alleyway. Things don't look promising in there either. On the left here, we see the galley the, that was severely, severely burned. And on the right, even spaces that were not burned or heat affected have been damaged by firefighting water. Here's the crew mess, uh, sadly living up to the modern meaning of the word. Outside again, and looking up to the bridge, we see that the windows appear to be blackened. Indeed, they were covered by soot on the inside, as was all the bridge equipment and furnishings. So what went wrong? Well, in terms of the start of the fire, clearly something with port main, uh, main generator engine, and that is under investigation. Fire experts have been appointed to uh, have a look at the whole thing, not just the cause and progression of the fire, but also the condition and functioning of the safety systems such as the fire flaps that should cut the air supply to the engine room and the CO2 release system. There are possibly some indications, I understand, that these systems may not have worked fully the way they should have uh, when they were needed. Okay, I think that'll be it for this month. I'll hand back to Paul to close out. Jasper, yep, we're uh, running out of time here, and there's a few more uh, uh, slides to uh, end up with. Let's skip through. Shame because we've got lots of interesting things on this month, but I know uh, the time is critical to everyone. Oh, so um, I'm going to ask you to complete our three minutes uh, uh, survey, help us improve our maritime. Uh, briefings and um and please um uh, register to join uh, in person our next uh, in person or online our next maritime briefing on the 14th of uh, december and hopefully see you there before uh, i go we've got questions and answers for tsi but i've got to add that um we could take questions uh, uh do questions and answers now but uh tsi have kindly um um, invited us or anybody here um, to uh, Balls Brothers um, at Minster Court for uh, questions and answers over coffee sandwiches from, um, I think we've booked it from 12.30, but I believe um, that they'll be going over there so we're fairly soon. So if anyone's interested, um, you're welcome to attend and then that goes to uh, your colleagues as well. So if there's any questions uh, from the immediate uh, uh, audience for um, TSI on their turbocharger um, presentation. Okay. We have one online, do we? Tell me. 
So, okay, so John Paul, this is one for you. Um, I'll, I'll read the question so that the online people can listen to it. Uh, most of the turbochargers are failed due to oil starvation, um, contamination, and foreign object damage. Uh, which cost is higher, replacing um, the unit or repairing? Diagnosing to the job and handle with fresh bearings and seals can live on to serve, but blockage in the pipe or intercooler cost might get increased. What technology accolades to be made turbochargers incur without failure, even high? All right, so that's quite a, um, a task of a question there. I think the, uh, that the first part, um, what is the cost, uh, you know, the higher cost in replacing or actually repairing? Just tell me then, I'll, I'll pass it on. Okay, so most of the table charges are paid due to observation, contamination. Yes, of course, the um, the best scenario is replacing rather than repairing, taking consideration also the um, uh, downtime cost. So when you add up all uh, all the costs with regards to repairing, downtime, and everything else, replacing is the is the best way forward. Diagnosing the uh, to the job and handle with fresh bearings and seals can live to serve, but blockage in the pipe or intercooler cost might get increased. What technology accolades that make turbochargers in care without failure, even load is higher act. It's not clear the question. <laughs> Question is clear to me either. Well, it might be to you. It's uh, yeah, we've got any other ones? No, I think it just asked. Yeah, so we can. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. We'll see you uh, next time. We'll see you for the second.